Good afternoon, possibly good morning, depending on where you're listening to us from today. I appreciate everybody joining us for a great, uh, another great informational webinar that we're going to have for you today here at Advanta IRA. Uh, talk about something a little bit different that we haven't discussed in a while. We have a great guest host joining us today to really talk about maybe how different ways or how you can invest your IRA offshore or your old 401k funds into offshore investments and maybe going over some of the reasons you might look to do that. Uh, you know, obviously some of the economic uh, concerns uh, in, in the world today. Uh, and then we'll obviously talk a little bit about the process uh, for doing so. But just uh, to start us off, uh, my name is Scott Maurer. I'll be your host today. I'm our vice president of sales here at Advanta IRA. I've been with the company for a number of different years and, and handled a lot of different types of transactions uh, over the years. And if you have questions when it comes down to self-directed IRAs, the types of accounts, the mechanisms for moving funds over into an account or, or maybe even some of the different investment options, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. My contact information is here on this slide. I will have it on, uh, have this slide up again towards the very end of the presentation if you aren't able to jot it down uh, now. Now, for those of you who are listening live, we are recording the webinar today. You can always go back and listen to it later. Um, but if you are listening live today, if you have any questions either for myself or for our guest host and guest presenter, uh, please type those into the questions box on your screen on the GoToWebinar control panel, and we'll make sure we get to those questions uh, during the presentation uh, today. Just a quick disclaimer, uh, Advanta IRA does not provide any investment advice. We do not endorse any particular products. Uh, the information, uh, the materials, the seminars, the webinars that we do are for educational purposes only. We like to bring different investment ideas and strategies to the forefront for uh, your thoughts and consideration, um, but you're still in, obviously encouraged to consult with your attorneys, accountants, financial advisors before entering into any type of an investment or investment strategy. Uh, we can always give you referrals to those types of individuals uh, if you need it. Um, and just a little bit about Advanta IRA. If you're new to self-direction or you're new to Advanta as a company, uh, we only, uh, the, the advantages of working with Advanta, we have over $2.7 billion in assets under management. Uh, we give a great, uh, we really spend a lot of time dedicated and focused on the customer service experience that we give to uh, our clients, to our referral partners and everyone involved. And, and that's really giving people one point of contact or two points of contact at the firm, direct names and numbers and emails that you can reach out to. Uh, with any questions you have uh, regarding your account. We also do a lot of educational events, like for instance, the webinar that we're doing today. Again, where we're trying to bring different uh, things maybe you haven't thought about before, or maybe things that you are very interested in and wanna hear from an industry expert on. Uh, we do that a lot through our webinars. We do one or two webinars a week. We also host an online networking event uh, once a month on a Friday, uh, where it's an open forum to come and not only uh, learn from other people, but also pitch any investments you're looking to sell, maybe any investments you're looking to acquire. Uh, so make sure you, you check that out. Now, again, all of the webinars that we do are recorded. We have a great video library on YouTube. You can go and listen, obviously, to this event today if you wanted to, to go back over it again. Or if you miss a webinar sometime, uh, you can always go back and catch it um, on our YouTube page. Now, just a little bit of information quick. Again, if you're new to self-directed IRAs, what exactly is a self-directed IRA? Well, that's it's in the type of an account, and it's important to know that self-directed is not a uh, refers more to your investment options. It's not the type of IRA, which I'll talk about in just a minute, but it's really giving you the account owner the complete control, your flexibility to invest in assets that you know and that you understand, or maybe that you trust or have a different feeling on when it comes to what do I want as the investments held inside my retirement portfolio. Uh, most people are familiar with mutual funds, stocks, and bonds because most IRAs, most 401ks are held with banks, brokerage firms who offer you those types of products. The IRS rules allow you to invest in a much, much broader range of investments, um, but not every custodian is willing to or able to hold different assets like we'll, like, we'll, like we'll talk about in today's presentation. So the fact that you haven't heard about self-directed IRAs is mainly because the folks that are holding your current accounts now do not offer the various range of investments that are possible really when you look within a self-directed IRA. The only two investments that you cannot make 
within an IRA, you cannot buy life insurance products and you cannot purchase collectibles like antiques, artwork, things of that nature. But outside of those two investments, there's a number of different assets that you can hold, but you have to have a custodian who's willing to hold it. And that's the role we serve at Advanta IRA, again, with a self-directed account. Um, as far as which accounts can be self-directed, you know, any type of IRA, your traditional IRA, your Roth IRA, uh, maybe you own a small business and you have a SEP IRA or a simple IRA, you can certainly self-direct those accounts. Um, also, any former employer's plan, if you have an old 401k, an old 403b plan from a, a previous job, you can roll that money over into a traditional IRA or into a Roth IRA and then use that money to be self-directed. So again, self-directed IRA is your ability to take money within a traditional or a Roth or a SEP and invest it into the alternative assets that we have. So again, if you're uh, the accounts we have, again, in our, our firm are traditionals, they are Roth IRAs, they follow the exact same contribution rules, the exact same distribution rules. The self-directed is really, again, the ability to take advantage of other types of assets. Now, moving money into a self-directed IRA happens in one of two ways, uh, and it depends largely on where you are moving the funds from. Uh, if your current account with your other custodian is an IRA, again, whether it's a Roth or a traditional, then you would move money via a transfer where you would fill out a, a document with Advanta. We submit it on your behalf to your current custodian, who will then send the funds over to us directly from that other IRA that you have into the IRA account that you've opened with us. Um, if you have money in an old 401k or one of those former employer plans, the process is simply called doing a direct rollover where you would reach out to the plan administrator of that former 401k and ask them to send the funds to the new IRA that you've created with us. Both transfers and direct rollovers are non-taxable events. Um, there is some reporting uh, for, for when you do a direct rollover, but again, it's still not a taxable event. There just might be some reporting to the IRS to show that rollover, which is something we, again, take care of on our end as a custodian. Transfers and rollovers take anywhere from a few days to a few weeks, just depends on your other custodian and the account type that you have there. When it comes to the different types of assets, um, again, we're gonna talk more specifically about offshore things, but again, the realm of, of different investments you can make is diverse. Again, the common thread with all of the assets you see on this slide, uh, to one extent, is that they are not life insurance and they are not collectibles. So again, it's whether it's property, mortgage loans, foreign currency, the uh, you know investing offshore into overseas markets, um, all of those assets, the things in common, again, they're not life insurance and collectibles. And these are also assets that you typically cannot hold inside a bank or a brokerage firm IRA. Uh, the Fidelities and the Schwab's of the world are not gonna allow you to hold these assets or hold money in an offshore account because it doesn't fit within their business model and that's not exactly how they're set up. Um, so again, that's a common thread with these types of assets uh, within a self-directed IRA. Now, as we move into, I'm going to introduce our presenter or guest presenter here in just a moment. Uh, but again, if you have questions for, during the webinar, please, please type those into the questions box on your screen. Either myself or Jamie will get those answered for you. Um, but yeah, at this time, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to bring in our guest, um, Jamie, with the CEO and managing partner of WHVP. Uh, which is a Swiss wealth management firm for U.S. and international clients. Um, you see her, her bio here on this particular screen, and I know that she's going to have some of her contact information as well uh, to share with you as we go through the presentation. Um, actually, I had a really quick question uh, pop up that I'll go ahead and just knock out now, Jamie, before we get into your presentation, but someone asked, is it okay to purchase a property and not rent it? Um, and the question is, um, yes, you can purchase real estate in an IRA and not necessarily rent it. You just are prohibited from actually using or, uh, or living in it personally. So we have a lot of clients who have bought, for example, raw land, which you, they're just holding it for the potential appreciation uh, of that particular asset. So um, the answer is yes, it is okay to do so as long as you're not living in it or getting any personal use. But at this time, Jamie, I'm going to turn the, the controls over to you and and let you um, talk and obviously share what it is that your firm does and, and how people can use their IRA to invest in uh, offshore accounts. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here um, today with all of you and spend the next few minutes um, together. As Scott mentioned, if you have any questions, then feel free to type them into the box. I'm more than happy to have more of a dialogue um, over just me presenting. Um, I'm not going to speak much further about myself. Scott was kind enough to already say a few words, but I'm, I'm dialing myself into from Zurich, Switzerland. And again, I'm very happy to be talking about how you can internationalize your IRA, your self-directed IRA. What, what will we be covering um, in the next 30 or so minutes? First, I want to talk about the state of international markets and maybe even before we head into the state of the international markets, I also want to talk a little bit about why international markets are interesting in the first place. Uh, we will then talk a little bit more about Switzerland specifically. Again, this is uh, where I call home, where I'm calling in from. And then lastly, we'll give you some practical ideas of how you can internationalize your IRA, the involved parties, the processes and steps. Um, involved if you're interested in considering this option. And then lastly, we have a quick Q&A session, depending on how many of your questions already come in during the presentation, that might be a bit shorter or longer. Now, um, why do we talk about international investment opportunities and international stock market? When I show you this graph, if I would ask you if you want to put your life savings, your retirement savings um, into this investment class, you'd probably say, uh, no, thank you. But the fact of the matter is that this is the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar. And if you are an American, if you are U.S. based, then chances are the vast majority, if not all of your assets, are already invested in that asset class. And this is a very long time horizon. So this is the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar since its inception. But even if we look just at the past 20 years or so, if we compare the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar with a stable currency like the Swiss franc, for example, the US dollar has lost about 78% of its value just since 2000. So this is certainly something to keep in mind when we talk about international markets. It's not just about the specific investment options, but it's also about protecting yourself by investing into foreign currencies that have upwards potential against the US dollar and not to have all of your, bas uh, all of your eggs in a US dollar basket. Now, on top of the US dollar devaluation, there is another very important reason why we should be talking about international investment opportunities, and that is volatility. When we talk about volatility, we just mean the upwards and downwards movement of uh, your portfolio or your wealth. And when we look at this graph, we see here the change in the volatility of your portfolio uh, in comparison of what percentage of your portfolio is invested in non-US stocks or in international stocks. And what we see here is volatility goes down um, up until 35, between 25 and 35 percent of an international allocation to your portfolio. So we are not saying that the US doesn't have good investment opportunities or that you should move all of your wealth in, into international investment. But what we are saying is that it certainly makes sense to take a portion of your liquid assets and inter internationalize those, um, not just to benefit from a diversification out of the US dollar, but also to have less volatility in your portfolio and thus a more stable overall performance. Now, you might be wondering how many investment opportunities there even are outside of the US. Obviously, the US is one of the biggest and most well-known and also one of the most popular stock markets there are, but it's by far not everything the world has to offer. So what we see here is the market capitalization of the US stock market. And when we look at it over the past 50 years, so starting in the 1970s, um, the share has gotten smaller as a trend and is now currently at about 45%. So that means if you're only investing in US stocks, you are ex excluding about 55% of all stock market um, options that are out there. Now um, that we have covered a little bit about why people are in considering international stocks and that there are plenty of options outside of the US, let's look at why right now is a very good time to be internationalizing your portfolios. First of all, what we see here is a forecast of annualized returns. So that means 
um, six large financial institutions have made projections on the stock market recurrence that they are projecting to be happening um, over the next 10 years and have broken that down to a yearly basis. And what we see is developed stock markets that are not U.S. stock markets are projected to grow 9.4%, whereas U.S. stocks are projected to grow 6% a year. So we see um, right now a lot of the institutional um, investors are um, expecting international stocks to be outperforming. And why is that? Um, when we look at diversification, it makes sense that international stock markets perform better when the U.S. stock market is struggling and vice versa. So right now, the U.S. stock market is doing very well and has been doing well for a long time. We're going to talk about that um, a bit more in a minute. But the forecast is that there's going to be some rough winds heading towards the U.S. stock market and that will be beneficial for international markets. So when we look at this, what are we seeing here? The blue uh, line indicates the MSCI EASE outperformance. This is a, a horrible abbreviation, um, but what it says is essentially an index that includes large and mid-cap companies from the developed markets in Europe, um, Australasia, and the Far East. So most major um, economies in Europe, for example, Germany, Italy, Switzerland, are included in that as well as Far East, like Israel, but then also some developed markets in Asia, like Hong Kong, for example, Singapore or Japan. Um, and that is contrasted with the S&P 500, which represents the U.S. stock market. And what we see here is the blue part on the line shows the overperformance of international markets and the orange uh, shows the overperformance of the U.S. market. So what's interesting to see here is that around the time of the uh, great financial crisis, 2008, uh, international stock markets have outperformed because of the difficulties in the U.S. stock market. And even after the crisis, the international stocks have outperformed the U.S. stocks. We're going to see that uh, in just a slide. What we see now the past um, 12 years or so since the recovery from the crisis, the U.S. market has outperformed the international stocks. And that is mainly due to the very loose monetary policies of the U.S. and also the increase of spending of the U.S. So in the short term, that has um, led to a lot of market growth. In our perspective, this is not really a very sustainable way to grow. And we do believe with a debt to GDP ratio of about 140% that we see with the U.S. right now, that there's going to be um, some corrections in the market and that the party cannot go for it on forever and as soon as the winds turn that will be um, beneficial for international markets this is what we see here so this is now zoomed into the time frame right after the the last financial crisis between 2008 and 2012 we see that international markets have outperformed u.s markets by 17 percent and that's something that we expect to happen again if we see another crisis in the u.s now that I have spoken uh, about the international market in comparison to the US, I just want to have a look at the European markets. And I do that by looking at the PE ratio. So that's the ratio of the price of a stock um, divided by the earnings of the company. And what we see here, again, we have quite a long track record of uh, almost 25 years where the average PE ratio was 0 0.87. Um, well, that, that's not the P ratio, but that's like the, the percentage that we see on the long term average. And we are now 30 percent below that, meaning that international developed stocks are traded at a significant discount. And the discount is uh, more significant than we have uh, ever seen before in recent history, which, of course, means that now is a very good um, time to get into the international stock markets at a reasonable pricing. Now, you might be wondering how you can access international stock markets. And in the US, options are limited. So there are ADRs. Those are essentially um, uh, securities that banks give out that mirror the price of an international stock, but they are typically traded in US dollars. So while it gives you access to a international stock, you lose the exposure to the foreign currency and the potential gain 
in value uh, of th that currency because you're still in US dollars. The other option that you have in the US is to go into ETFs or funds that um, cover indices or whole international stock markets. But what we find is lacking in the US is a discretionary asset management mandates where you work together with an asset manager or a bank, bank that does um, individual stock picking for you inter in international markets. And it makes sense that that um, is a limited option because, of course, international markets have other trading times. Um, they work a little bit differently. Sometimes there are language barriers. So in our uh, opinion, it makes sense to work with people who are based in the markets that you're looking to invest at and to collaborate with people who know the, uh, the geography, the culture, the language of the places that you want to be trading in. As I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, I am based in Zurich, Switzerland. My company, WHUP, is based in Switzerland as well. And of course, that does make us a little bit biased. I feel very lucky um, to be living in Switzerland, but there's also a lot of objective reasons why Switzerland is a great place to start if you want to get into international markets. And that's what I want to talk about next. So Swiss banking is probably a term that you're familiar with, be it from James Bond movies or from the press. And there is a reason that Swiss banking is uh, known worldwide. Uh, we have one of the longest track records when it comes to private wealth management. During the Middle Ages, um, people in the country started to manage the wealth of wealthy royal families. Of course, today we don't uh, only work with royal families, even though um, some of them certainly still have their money in our country. We also work with um, regular people who have accumulated uh, a certain level of wealth over their lifetime. Our private banking culture has evolved with a very high regard for privacy, but that's not just culturally speaking, that is also something that's very deeply ingrained in our constitution and our regulatory framework, as well as banking secrecy laws that are still in place today. Then Switzerland is also a militarily neutral country. Uh, we have been for a very long time. That's also something that is uh, dotted down in our constitution. Uh, we do not get involved in any armed conflict, and um, one of the re this is one of the reasons why we have great economic stability. We were one of the countries that um, fared through the pandemic fairly well. Um, all of that means that we are a great place for banks to exist today. So we have about 243 banks in Switzerland, considering that we only have a population of 8 million people. That's quite a lot of banks. Uh, we have one of the highest uh, banks per person in a country number uh, worldwide. And that also means that we manage a huge chunk of global cross-border wealth. So about 25% of all global cross-border wealth is currently being managed in Switzerland. And um, on top of that, we also have an exceptional education system. So it's normal for people to do an apprenticeship over here. That's an education that is held in very high regard. Um, people like myself, we start working at corporate banks at the tender age of 15. So we get training in all relevant departments. And then later on, when we head to university, we oftentimes still have a part-time corporate job. So we really have a lot of experience at a very young age. And we are not just academically trained, but we also see how it is applied in the real world. Then we are a, a service-oriented country, so we pride ourselves on our professionalism, integrity, punctuality, and then of course also the federal laws and rules and regulations that really have a strong focus on client protection and again, client privacy. So I mentioned um, how many banks we have and that that's quite significant in comparison to our population. Here I have a graph that shows how many or how much the banking sector makes up in regards to the GDP of a country, and you see Switzerland is, has by far the largest financial center in compared to the size of the country. Um, the US is also uh, in the top 10, but on one of the places a little bit further behind. Now, um, what about the Swiss economy? So I already talked about how the Swiss economy is quite strong. Um, we have one of the highest GDP per capita in the world. It's almost 100,000 Swiss francs. But at the same time, we also have a very low level of public debt. So I mentioned earlier in the presentation that the U.S. has a debt-to-GDP ratio of about 140 percent. 
Switzerland, um, Switzerland's debt to GDP ratio hovers around 40%. And one of the reasons is we have a very, we hold fiscal responsibility in very high regard. So over the past 20 years, uh, our government has achieved to generate a surplus in 14 of those years. And then of the six years that didn't generate a surplus, two of them were uh, COVID years. So I, I think that's a, a fairly decent um, statistic. And then we also have a debt break. A lot of countries have a concept um, similar to, to that that we have, but we actually really live up to the standard. So the debt break means that the government is not allowed to spend more than it takes in, essentially. Um, there are some adjustments for like economic cycles and such, um, but overall you have to be very um, responsible with your fiscal duties as a politician. So if you're spending more in one area, you have to say, the money in another area and that has worked very well for us. And then another notable difference between Switzerland and the US in, in terms of economy is that our national bank only has one goal or like one duty and that's price stability. So in the US, the Fed has two goals. One is price stability and the other is full employment. And sometimes those two goals or duties can be as competition with each other. There can be a conflict of interest. Uh, the Swiss National Bank doesn't have that. They are only responsible for price stability. And that was also one of the reasons we believe that Switzerland um, did fairly well in recent waves of inflation. Our peak in 2022 was 3.5%, which is quite a bit higher than the 0 to 2% that we're aiming for, but it's still manageable. Right now, inflation is at 1.7%, so right back at the target. And all those factors that I now just mentioned also lead to the Swiss franc being one of the strongest currencies in the world. It is especially sought after during volatile times, during times of crisis and geopolitical um, problems and escalations, which is also one of the reasons that the Swiss franc has gained um, even more strength recently than it already had. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about the specific setup. So we have covered why international stocks or international exposure to stocks makes sense. We have spoken about why now is a good time to go into international markets. And we have talked a little bit about why it makes sense to partner with someone who's based in Switzerland, most notably with a bank that's based in Switzerland. And what I'm trying to show here is everyone who is involved in the process. And that might uh, look a bit confusing on a first glance, but I try to go through it step by step. Um, so you can see that it's not as complicated as it looks at the first glance. So we have US clients in the middle on top, uh, the most important person, obviously. And then as Scott mentioned earlier, for your self-directed IRA, you need to be working with an administrator like, for example, Advantum. And they can then help you get introduced with an asset manager like ourselves. So my company, WHVP, would be considered an independent asset manager. And we can introduce you to a custodian bank, either here in Switzerland or in Liechtenstein, um, which is one of the neighboring countries of Switzerland. It's very similar in terms of regulatory framework, privacy, and they also have the Swiss franc as a trading currency. Their population is even smaller than the population of Switzerland. They only have about 30,000 people living there. Now, um, what this means is that we as the independent asset manager decide together with you and the administrator which bank would be the right fit for you. We would then introduce you to the bank, um, help you get onboarded with them. Um, we as an independent asset manager will receive a limited power of attorney to trade on your behalf and make international investments on your behalf with um, advance on making sure that everything is done in a legal and compliant way. And you obviously uh, being constantly and consistently talked to. So that's very important. Now, having said that and, and showed all those different parties involved, uh, we are a boutique firm and it's very important to us to have personal relationship with every single client that we onboard and we guide you through the whole process. So you don't have to worry about knowing people everywhere and keeping track of everything. You will have one specific contact person at our office that can walk you through the whole concept and through the whole process. So you just have one person that you need to know and to, that you need to remember and they can help you with everything. Um, 
Now the investments, that's just from like a WHEP perspective. So we as independent asset managers, um, we focus on US clients who are looking to internationally diversify their wealth. We have long-term capital preservation strategies, especially for self-directed IRAs, because we believe that if you are already in retirement, your main goal should be that you have a decent return that keeps up with the purchasing power of the US dollar, that keeps up with the fees that you're paying, but not to take excessive risk and um, risking that you are losing your initial or part of your initial capital without having the ability to make that money back up with an employment. Um, as mentioned in the beginning, we do very much believe in international diversification. So we do believe that it's very important to actually have a part of your wealth outside of the US dollar and outside of the US um, stock market, which is why we completely exclude the US dollar and US dollar nominated investments from the portfolios. Not because we don't believe that they're good or valuable or serve a purpose, but rather because we believe that it makes more sense for you to cover those areas from within the US rather than uh, employing someone across the globe to then go back into the US market. We focus on the area of the world that we are familiar with, that we know that we have good access um, to information, etc. Then again, you have the option if you work with someone abroad to make direct investments into stable economies that are outside of the US. Um, for us, we have a top-down approach combined with a little bit of a bottom-up approach where we assess a country and the currency and make sure that it's something that we believe is going to gain value against the US dollar. We are going to assess the industry as well as the company. And then we are also looking for bottom-up investment opportunities. If that's something that you're interested in learning more about in terms of how we go about selecting our investments or what a sample portfolio could look like, then do not hesitate to reach out to me and I'm happy to send that over to you. Yeah, and Jamie, we actually had somebody have a, a question. I was gonna to jump in. I thought that was a okay. good time with what, what you were just talking about. Um, sure. Obviously, we're talking about different types of stocks and, and, and similar types of security investments. Someone asked if you can comment about do you, investing in real estate products. and Is this your area of expertise? I don't believe that it is, but when it comes to investment selection, are there different types of, I guess, overseas or, or European real estate funds that is part of, can, can be part of your uh, investment selection process? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. So we don't just invest in stocks. Um, this is just like the, the main focus for this presentation. We also have um, international bonds. We also invest in precious metals. And then we also invest in foreign currencies. Our company doesn't invest in real estate. Um, I would assume that there are real estate um, funds and products that you can invest in that has overseas real estate in it. What's very important to note there, though, even though I'm not a tax specialist and expert, and I always advise um, on consulting with a CPA that understands international investments, um, if the fund is issued in Europe, it's very important to make sure that it's licensed in the US as well, because if it's not, it's considered a PFIC, and then ca that can have very negative tax consequences. Um, but it's not something, real estate, that we offer ourselves. Gotcha. Um, and when it comes to, I mean, um... One of the charts you showed kind of showed, you know, when when you know what over over the years, which U.S. when the U.S. market has outperformed the European market or vice versa. Um, in years when the European and and over other overseas markets have done better, is it done better in particular industries specific, or has it just been kind of as a whole? You know, I guess for example, if the if the U.S. markets are not doing well, um, is it what what about what what is in the European markets that's more attractive? Are there specific industries that then do better as the U.S. market does better? Not just on a currency basis, but on maybe just yeah. you know different diff, you know, tech, whether it's tech or whether it's healthcare or things like that. Yeah, this this is something that I can't really answer just generally because every time it's different, right? Every time the European market outperforms the U.S. Part market, there's a variety of factors that play into it, and not every time the same industry is going to outperform. Um, what what I find very important to note is that we don't believe I, I do believe right now is a very good time to go into international markets. But even if right now the stars wouldn't be aligning for it to be very attractive to go international markets, we still believe in diversifying. 
because the US market and other international markets are not perfectly correlated. So they're never going to move exactly the same. They might sometimes move in similar directions, but it's never the same. So that means even um, in times that the European stock market might not be extremely outperforming the US, if you look for a long enough time horizon, you will always have more stability in your portfolio if you include more diverse geographical areas. It's okay, and then that did answer my question, I guess, to an extent that it's not always industry industry specific from that standpoint. Um, yeah. Some someone did ask a question. Said, "What is the average return that maybe you see with the the when you the the investments that you look at? Kind of what is your average return? I, I know obviously things will vary a little bit depending on a portfolio makeup, but you know what what is yeah. roughly the average return you you typically see? At least that's the question someone asked. If you can answer it." Yeah, so past performance is always a bit tricky because first of all, obviously past performance is no indication for future performance. And then also the SEC has very strict rules in place. Um, what you need to consider in order for you to be allowed to give out past performance. So the majority of our portfolios are individualized. That means we get to know you, we look at your risk tolerance, your time horizon, your preferences, certain industries that you might want to exclude from the portfolio, et cetera. That means the majority of our portfolios are set up differently and put together differently, and we can't just lump them all together to get one past performance. We have one exception. We used to have a standardized investment program that ran from the beginning or the end of 2017 until the end of 2023. So we have six years with a moderate approach to risk. And for those six years, we had a net performance of 6.77% a year. Um, I, I always say that for a moderate portfolio that we aim for a performance of 5 to 6% net of fees a year. Um, but again, it depends very much on your personal circumstances. It depends on how you want the portfolio constructed. Gotcha. Okay. And uh, so someone else had a, a great question with um, bond rates. Um, it said, how do bond rates in Switzerland compare to some of the rates in the US and maybe where is a good place to review them? Is that something you have resources for that can contact you or, or some other place they might be able to, to check out the bond rates comparisons of, of obviously overseas markets with what's available in the US? Yeah, absolutely. So if you are interested in like specific investment opportunities and specific bond rates, it's best to just send me an email. I have my email up a few slides down the road, but just generally speaking, Swiss bonds are not very competitive compared to US bonds because the Swiss franc is such a strong currency. Our interest rates they go up significantly less than US interest rates. So you'd be earning much less on a highly rated Swiss franc bond compared to a US dollar bond. But there are other interesting bonds um, that you can invest in. There are also um, European companies that are highly rated that denominate their bonds in emerging market currencies. So for example, um, there is a European bank um, that we have been watching for a while. They have issued some bonds in Mexican peso. So that could be something where we have an interesting year where we get a little bit of emerging market exposure as well. So there's certainly interesting international bond opportunities, but the Swiss bonds are not too attractive right now. Okay, great. Yeah, so good, great questions so far from the audience. If anyone listening has any additional questions they want to ask uh, here before we, as we get towards the end of the webinar today, please get those uh, typed into the question box. Jamie, I'll let you go back, back to your presentation. Sounds good. So what I have here is just a little bit of the process. So if you are interested, if that sounded intriguing to you, best would be to reach out just for a complimentary consultation. Then we can talk about the whole setup a bit in a bit more detail, we can also address any questions you might have that you don't want to ask now in front of everybody. Um, we can also talk about like what the specific steps are to get on board with Advanta. Um, that is typically the first step in the process is I would make uh, an intro to Scott so you can talk to him as well um, for his side of the process, ask him any questions that you might have. Uh, we will then ask for some information to get the ball rolling. So typically that's a copy of a valid and signed US passport, um, just an intake form that's called investor profile where we ask a bit about your family and financial situation. Um, we will need a CV where you see like your main working stations as well as your main education. 
And then lastly, a source of funds documentation. So that could be a copy of a tax statement or like a, an income statement, just something that shows how the wealth was generated. With that information, we would then go to the private bank, present your case. Once you have been accepted by them, they will issue the application forms and then Advanta and yourself will have some paperwork to do. Again, we try to make it as easy as possible. We pre-complete as much as we can. We give instructions on where you have to complete information yourself, where you have to sign, etc. And then you send that back to us. The account will be open. Once it has been opened, we will confirm that to you and Advanta, and Advanta will then fund the portfolio. Once the account has been funded, we will set up another call or Sue meeting where we talk about the initial investment in some more detail. On average, I would say the whole account opening process takes between three and four weeks. There's a little bit of administrative paperwork involved, but again, we guide you through every step of the way. And then once everything has been invested, we are, of course, staying in regular contact. So we send out a market commentary every six weeks. You have an online access to the account where you can see your investments. Um, you also get a quarterly bank statement. You get a yearly tax statement. And then, of course, we also have regular portfolio discussions up to four times a year. Now, as promised, um, here's my contact information. It's best to just email info at whvp.ch. You can set up a consultation with myself. And as a special little treat for the listeners today, if you want to get a free copy of a book I have co-authored called Swiss Money Secrets, where I talk more about the Swiss Financial Center, our history, politics, and what made us uh, one of the leaders in private wealth management, then you can just send me an email as well to info at whp.ch. Just write book in the subject line and I will send you a digital copy of that. Those were the most important points that I wanted to have covered today. And I'm not sure if there are any questions left, then feel free to ask them now. And if there are no questions, you can, of course, also Follow us on all the social media sites. We are fairly active in trying to um, publish educational context that might be interesting to you. Good. Yeah, Jamie, we did have a couple more questions pop in, and um, one of them just just said, so to be clear, I cannot, I can or cannot hold a real real property asset in the Swiss fund. I think maybe the answer. So, from the IRA side, if you're looking at IRA, IRA rules would allow you to buy real estate. In, in Switzerland or really any any foreign country for that matter. So there's no restriction there. I think what Jamie was saying is they don't specialize or really focus on real estate as an asset uh, within the investments that they hold or that they manage for, for clients. Is that, that a fair statement, Jamie? Absolutely, yeah, that's correct. Okay. Um, someone did ask what the typical size of investments are for individuals. And I guess I'll, I'll dovetail that a little bit. The other question someone asked, is there a minimum amount to set yep. up and invest with. And I, and I want to make it clear to the individuals listening, you know, Jamie, I talked before I had to, you can, you obviously we're an IRA company and, and we've worked with, you know, we've had clients work with us and work with Jamie to invest overseas using their IRA, but you can also invest individually. So the, the information here is not, Jamie's firm, it can also work with you on an individual basis, but you know, is there a typical size of the investments? And also is there a minimum amount that you, you can set up and, and, and work with? Yeah, absolutely. So the minimum investment volume is 500,000 US dollars. Um, this is just due to the complexity of cross-border wealth management and all the rules and regulations that the US has in place for international investments. Um, there's not really an, like a typical or an average size um, of the account. Every family is different and every individual is different. And if you meet the minimum investment volume, then we're happy to just have a chat and see um, if this could be a good fit or not. Okay. Um, so see, I don't see any other questions that came in here towards the end, but um, yeah, Jamie, I want to at least take take a second here before we let more questions come in. But thank you, obviously, for joining us today and, and sharing some information um, on obviously what you do and other options that people have, you know, outside of the U.S. markets. Because I think a common thread that um, individuals who who've used self-directed IRAs over the years has been that they are either you know distrustful maybe or, or maybe just looking for alternatives and some diversity from the US markets, whether they're seeking things overseas, you know, investments overseas, or whether they're even just looking into real estate and some of the other assets uh, that we can hold from here. You know, just you know the, the US markets make them a little bit nervous. Um, 
I guess, you know, kind of just something I was thinking too, the, you know, obviously looking part of what you're saying here is your, your model, you know, the models are showing a, a potential downturn for us uh, markets at some point, you know, obviously uh, nobody has a crystal ball to know exactly when. Uh, and I think, you know, I know that people who we living here in the U S we hear the same thing too, with the amount of money that's been borrowed and that's been, um, you know, the, the inflation issues that we've had, how do you guard against, I guess, maybe if, you know, people looking to invest overseas, if the U S market, doesn't take as, as quick a downturn as maybe people are thinking or, or how are they still how are people still protected with the investments overseas i'm assuming they can still it's not like it, the they wouldn't make money they'd still make money just maybe giving up uh, uh positions in the u.s market yeah absolutely i think that comes back to, to what we're saying in the beginning internationally diversifying having your eggs in several baskets is always a good idea because you never know when and if a downturn is coming in which market. So the more evenly distributed it is, the less volatility and the less rapid changes you will have. And then the other aspect is really the US dollar um, evaluation. Even if there's not a sharp decrease in stock market prices, the US dollar is most likely gonna continue to lose value just because the, the government politicians and the Fed, they don't have an interest in a strong US dollar. They have way too much debt um, to have an interest in, in getting the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar up. I mean, inflation is the easiest way to get rid of debt, and um, we don't think that the inflation is going to come down uh, to, to reasonable levels anytime soon. So um, we believe that having different investment avenues in different regions of the world makes sense at any point in the economic cycle and at any point of the stock market cycle, it's just now is a particularly good time based on our assessment. But even if we would be wrong, or even if it does take longer to happen than, than what we anticipate, you will still have more stability and the protection against the devaluation of your home currency. Gotcha. Um, yeah, so as we, as someone asked what the minimum investment amount is again, I think you mentioned it's is $500,000 is whether it's an individual or an IRA, that's the minimum investment amount. Um, so the other questions of anything to highlight the difference in investing in a fund like EWL iShares Switzerland and directly through a Swiss custodian. I'm hoping that makes um, sense to you. That that was a question. Anything to highlight the difference in investing in a fund like EWL iShares Switzerland and directly through a Swiss custodian? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what you have is the financial safety of Switzerland as a financial services center, right? Um, the U.S. Is, is polarized right now. We have uncertainty. We have an upcoming political um, uh, election. It, it's unclear what direction the country is going to take. And by having a part of your wealth outside of the country, you will also be more protected because your wealth is less affected by domestic political development. So it's possible to ha have a U.S.-based um, bank account with a U.S. Uh, bank uh, and then invest it in a Swiss fund. You get some of the benefits. Most likely, again, you're not going to get the currency benefit, and you're also not getting the benefits of more privacy protection and the safe jurisdiction that will be less affected by geopolitical tensions, right? I mean, with everything that's going on right now, Switzerland, again, is a neutral country. It's not part of the European Union. It's not part of NATO. So by having money in a country like ours, you also have more protection in other uh, dimensions than just the investment benefits that you're getting. All right. Well, Jamie, again, thank you. We haven't had, we don't have any other questions that popped up and we're getting close to here to the end of the time. So I want to, again, thank you for your, your time. And if anyone has any other questions about uh, what we talked about today, or you want to get in touch with Jamie, their contact information is here on the screen. Um, I found them to be very, very responsive and, and very helpful. Um, so please do reach out to, to Jamie and, and her team. Um, again, if uh, some, well, actually a good question just popped up. How easy is it to withdraw money? as needed. So once the money has been, say, placed yeah. in, in the account in Switzerland, and then you need to pull some of that money out, how easy it is to get that money uh, pulled back over? Yeah, that's a great question, a very important one. Um, for us, it's incredibly important that we don't have any lockup periods, that we don't punish the client for taking back money, um, whether they just want to or need to, whatever the situation is. So you can take money back essentially from day one if you have to, or if you're unhappy for any reason. Uh, the only thing that we require is an originally signed letter. So we need like a wet ink signature. That's just for like cybersecurity reasons. But once we have the letter, we can sell everything within a day and send it over to you. Uh, with international wire transfers taking two, three days. So I would say probably about five working days. 
days would be a reasonable expectation or like a assumption of how long it would take for you to take either a part or all of the money back to the US. Okay. All right, very good. Yeah, and someone asking the minimum is, is 500K, that's correct. That was another question somebody asked. But again, um, if you want to reach out to Jamie, again, their con to information is here. Someone asked, do you have a U.S. office? Um, I don't, don't think you have a U.S. office, but I know that, that you have you and both uh, ERS have been over here at times in the U.S. Yeah, absolutely. So we are both, uh, I, I run the company together with my husband, who's also my business partner. He and I were both in the U.S. about three, four times a year. So if you are living near one of the larger cities, chances are we are going to be there at some point in the next 12 months. Um, you can also find our travel schedule on their, um, uh, our website, whep.ch, get started. You can find where we're going, um, but we don't have a office in the U.S. So we are completely offshore. Our one and only office is here in Zurich, Switzerland. All right. Well, great. Um, will today's slides be made available? Uh, someone asked, uh, Jamie, if you want to just forward me over your slides, I can certainly uh, include those for anyone who might be interested, or I guess you could also reach out to, to you to get those. I'm assuming. Absolutely. Again, I mean, I'm happy to share an additional copy of Swiss Money Secrets. I'm also happy to share the slides. Just send me an email, info at whep.ch, and I will get that over to you. All right. Great. Well, again, uh, Jamie, thank you again very much for your, your time today. Um, if anyone has any questions on IRAs, so certainly you said you can reach out to myself and, and I'm happy to answer those on the, the self-directed side. Um, so, uh, yeah, Jamie, thank you very much for your time. And uh, no, I don't see any other questions here. We'll conclude the webinar.